Okay. Right. That should be recording. Welcome, everyone. Um, to uh, where are we? Well, we? We're in week four, session one of um, machine learning in the physical world. So last time uh, we showed you last week, we talked about different types of simulation that might exist and then gave an example of sequential decision making uh, using Bayesian optimization. So we used Gaussian processes as surrogate models um, in the case where we were trying to find the minima of a function. So today um, and tomorrow, what uh, I'm going to start looking at is uh, sort of a, a bit of emulation in practice. So if you go to the website uh, as normal, you'll find there's um, a notebook, which is um, uh, all live and runnable. You can run the Google Colab uh, to do some of the experiments I'll talk about today. But before going into the details of that, I wanted to sort of, as I want to do, focus a little bit on the philosophy of what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. So today I really want to sort of talk about emulation and why it's important. And uh, what I want to do is give an example from um, when we were working, um, myself and colleagues in the Amazon supply chain. And some of the software you'll be using uh, was written by, not uh, necessarily when we were at Amazon, but the friends and colleagues who were at Sheffield with me and at Amazon with me with targeting the type of problems I'm about to talk about. So the team, when we were at Amazon, we sort of developed this notion of um, the flywheel for scientific innovation, which I think you should sort of notice and it should resonate with you in terms of what we've talked about as uh, hypothesis analysis, which is the notion of doing an experiment, analyzing the experiment and designing a new experiment. Now, what interested us a lot in the context of supply chain was the need to understand what this large complex physical system was doing, but not just to understand what it was doing, but to accept that it was going to change over time and to build a set of tools that would allow us to understand what that's going to look like in the future. One of the things that uh, certainly stuck with me was a quote from Amazon CEO, Jeff Bezos, um, which I've included in the notebook, the uh, real quote, but it, it stuck with me because it was along the, the form of the following. He was asked, um, he says, well, I'm often asked, what's the world gonna look like in 10 years time? And the answer is, I don't know what will happen, but I can tell you what won't happen. And he said, from the business that I work in, Amazon, the retail perspective, people aren't going to want to pay more for stuff than they're paying today. They're not going to want their stuff to be delivered slower. And they're not going to want a smaller selection of things they can buy. So that was sort of a quote that he said, and the whole company is sort of focused around that, trying to keep prices low, reduce delivery time and uh, have a wide selection. But the question was for us as a team, how did that affect us as a team that was sort of doing the science machine learning side? So we basically converted it into um, this quote because really when we look at that experiment analyze design cycle, what we realized is any of those actions and the sort of action that I'm talking about is within the sort of uh, time we were in supply chain, um, Bezos unilaterally decided and announced in a shareholder letter that Amazon was moving to single day delivery across the whole of uh, the continental United States. Now, up until you get single day delivery for Amazon in the UK, but up until then you didn't, uh, same day delivery, I should, uh, sorry, single day delivery, one day delivery. Um, up until, uh, that year in the States, the guarantee was two days. That has an enormous effect on a massive physical supply chain. And the question is, what effect does it have? So in the end, what our team ended up looking at is now when I say science here, we were talking about science on the supply chain because they talked about us as a science team, not science as in large hadron colliders. We don't know what science will want into doing five years time. 
but we don't want to do slower experiments. We don't want to do more expensive experiments and we won't want a narrower selection of experiments. So it's obviously just taking that Bezos quote, but applying it to what was our business. But I think what is also the point in this module that if we look at science as a whole, um, people don't want to run experiments slower. They do want to run them quicker. If you say what's going to happen, this is, this is all stuff that is, is just as true as about retail. People will want a different diversity of experiments they can do. They won't want to pay more for those experiments. Um, and um, they uh, won't want those experiments to be slower. So what does that mean for us? Well, a lot of the answers um, come from emulation, because in effect, what it means is we want faster, cheaper, and more diverse sets of uh, experiments. And I mean, in the supply chain, we ended up with this sort of objective to increase as a two order of magnitude, the number of experiments we could run on the supply chain. Now, experiments on the supply chain, um, it was interesting, as soon as we said that, that required us to define it. And there's a number of different experiments you can run on the supply chain. You can run practical experiments where you, um, you change your business processes and you can do A-B testing on those experiments. There's a real world physical experiment, but of course you can do lots of experiments in simulation. So we meant that full diversity. So that's a sort of uh, Amazon story, but it could equally apply to say examples in Formula One where you have teams that are interested in um, producing a car. They're interested in making that car better on short turnarounds. Every two weeks, they race the car and they want the car to go faster on those two week timeframes. But they're also trying to produce a car across a year timeframe. So there's a number of things that they're doing, which were very similar to what actually goes on in supply chains. So in supply chains, you're making weekly orders to get your stock in on a regular basis to um, ensure that customers uh, find what they want. Uh, you're also making planning decisions about where you need to make uh, sort of hundreds of millions of dollars investment in building, building new fulfillment centers, and those are longer term. So these type of decisions are constantly there. And of course, they're also there in something like um, the uh, uh, Navier-Stokes equations that we use to run weather models. So uh, this plot here, it's a little bit smaller than I'd have liked because it's a PNG taken from the Met Office website, um, but it's representing the UK Met Office's um, weather models. Now, they have this extraordinary thing called the unified model. The unified model is a um, one code base that they run on this supercomputer. It was like 250 million when it was bought. Um, that in the same code base, they can do weather predictions or they can also do um, climate predictions. And what you're seeing in this plot here is a little bit like what you had uh, the situation for Amazon um, and also what we've talked about before in terms of uh, simulation, the different length scales. You have on the y-axis, um, says a grid length in kilometers and on the uh, x-axis it says forecast lead time now there's some different models and the gray ones are retired right so they're out of production they're old models but the um, uh, orange models are models that are in production and being used and my understanding is that these models the ones towards the left are uh, which are the weather forecast models are sort of run in the morning and the ones towards the right which are the climate models are run in the um, afternoon um, and what you'll see is that they're all operating at different uh, scales so you can see and I'm going to have to guess at these because I don't have the details in front of me but you've got UKV um, which says it's got a grid length of 1.5 kilometers and that's for the UK forecast I think it's on a five day um, it, it's, it's sort of near the seven but I think that's a five day forecast that they make with that that's what you get on a daily basis for the UK Met Office's weather forecast. But if you go above that, they um, discretize into four kilometer grids um, to make the European forecast. And then above that again, you'll see a 10 kilometer grid that is the global forecast. So you watch um, 
not quite sure what the current situation where BBC gets their weather forecast from, because there was some confusion over that at one point. But basically, most of the UK's um, weather is coming from the Met Office, and they'll make forecasts uh, for Australia. But those are, those forecasts are being made on a ten-kilometer grid rather than the one and a half-kilometer grid. Um, Neil, if, can we yeah. can invite all because I think there's some. Oh, I can't sure. invite people. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mean the um, in the waiting room? Oh, crumbs, I can't get to the waiting room. You, you, we got people, ah, oh, here we go, admit all, on the waiting room, there we go, yep. Okay, so um, I'll try and keep an eye on the waiting room, it doesn't always pop up for me. Um, so we've got these different granularities in terms of grid length, um, but then also in terms of forecast time. As you go to the right, you'll see, yes, there's a UK climate model that's trying to do 20 to 100 year forecasts on a 1.5 grid length scale. But then you have larger scale global um, climate models uh, that are doing these things on sort of 80 kilometer grid scales. So each of these is a different model that in this case, and this is sort of the big, the Met Office are very, um, it's like their branding, that they, they do everything in one model. I don't know whether that's a good idea or not. You could imagine doing things with different code bases. But each of these models we can see as uh, what one might call a different fidelity. So um, the uh, the models down to the sort of uh, bottom left are shorter time scales and they're shorter length scales. So they're very finely granular. And of course, the reason why we don't do that all the time is they're much slower to compute because they're having to resolve the Navier-Stokes equations um, on these very short time uh, scales and very uh, short length scales. In fact, it was only with this purchase of the Met Office's recent computer, which now must be about five or six years old, something like that, that we could get down to 1.5 kilometer grids. And if, as I used to, you live in Sheffield and you go cycling in the Peak District, you'll know that the weather in a sort of hilly area can change in even smaller than a 1.5 kilometer grid. You can be cycling out of Sheffield in bright sunshine and you can dip into a valley and uh, it pours with rain on you. That's sort of less true in Cambridge where it's flatter. So what does that mean for emulation? Well, all of these things are slow to run, um, but there's information about each of these things that is operating at different granularities. So this is the picture that I have in my head when I think about emulation. So um, what we have is a number of different simulators um, and they're working with different uh, granularities. So I've sort of drawn in the um, larger box on the left bottom, a simulator that is uh, perhaps a one that's doing um, more detailed fine grain. So it's bigger. It's, and what I mean by bigger, why do I draw it bigger? Well, it's because it's slower. But then I've got a couple of different simulators um, uh, which are also modeling the same system, but perhaps they're doing it with uh, coarser graining or perhaps they're using uh, sloppy approximations. We could also um, think of the sort of Formula One examples, the sort of thing that happens in a Formula One uh, aerodynamic testing setup and actually also happens in any aerodynamic testing setup. So when we were working on sort of prime air drones, the same thing would happen and the same thing would happen if you're developing planes, but it's the cycles at the speed of which you cycle this type of setup is uh, you have uh, sort of computational fluid dynamics simulations and computational fluid dynamics are again, they're using Navier-Stokes to try and give you a sense of what the drag and the lift will be. Um, in the case of a Formula One car, you want a negative lift because you're trying to push it into the ground, but a plane, you want positive lift. So you're getting the drag coefficient out of those simulations. But each of those simulations itself, uh, if turbulence happens, that's very, very difficult to model. So um, in the case of turbulence, these simulations tend to make different approximations. So you've got a variety of different computational fluid dynamics packages you can run on your components. You also have, say, for example, wind tunnel tests. So um, not every Formula One team, but a lot of Formula One teams have a wind tunnel on site, the, the richest ones do. 
And even if they don't have one on site, they'll do wind tunnel testing of components um, separate. So that's a different type of simulator. It's not a computer code simulator. But then you also have the real world. And, and just as the same with the weather, you have the real world weather that we can observe, or you've got the history of climate that we get from ice cores, this information um, that is real world data. So whenever you're trying to do your science on a system, this is the situation you have. The situation was similar in Amazon. You would have real world data of what you can see in terms of how your supply chain is operating. You have simulators which are trying to simulate the operation of your supply chain, and those are operating at different granularity or different time frames. So if you're trying to make forecasts for whether or not to build a new fulfillment center, the sort of time frame over which you're doing that is uh, obviously multiple years. Whereas if you're trying to make forecasts about um, which, um, how many Logitech mice to buy next week, um, and you know, a product like that, you would be buying every week, potentially. Um, you uh, want to do that on a sort of, you know, that's on the sort of seven day time horizon. So this stuff comes up again and again. So how does the emulator help? Well, the notion with the statistical emulator, what we've been looking at so far, and we'll continue to play with for the moment, but the bigger picture is the following. That the statistical emulator is a machine learning or a statistical model that uh, can reproduce what that simulator does. So, um, when we're looking at the Bayesian optimization example, um, we, were, had a, we had two things going on there. One, the emulator that was trying to fit the function, but two, the question about where's the minima of this function. Forget the question for the moment, just think about the emulation or the surrogate model that basically we're using and the models we've talked about in this uh, module are Gaussian processes. You can use other models as well. Um, you're using the Gaussian process to be a substitute uh, sort of surrogate for the simulator. Um, and that's the notion of emulation. But why, if, if that's all that's going on, then, then why is it interesting? Well, I think it's much more interesting than this initial idea would have you believe, because you can also use emulation to try and tally that back into the real world. So um, if you are trying to understand, for example, how is your simulator operating in compared to what's going on in the real world. You now need to make comparisons between what your simulator is saying and what the data from the real world is saying. Well, the way you can do that is you can build those comparisons into your emulator. Because if you build an emulator that is jointly looking at the simulation, so let's say in this case, the CFD um, from the, uh, uh, com the so computational fluid dynamics, from a Formula One um, uh, simulation, you can compare with what happens on the track. Now, the question with what happens on the track is, is hard because things are noisy, the, the environment isn't controlled. So you now do need to start modeling the difference between what you're seeing in the simulation and what you're seeing in the real world. Now in uh, Formula One simulation, one of the things that is uh, problematic is that the one of the most important things you can look at is uh, a slow speed corner because many long straights follow slow speed corners. Um, unfortunately, on a slow speed corner, you get this effect where the car is turning through a very sharp angle and um, the front of the car actually has a different angle of fluid flow across it than the rear of the car. Um, now the wind tunnels people have cannot recreate those circumstances. So what you start finding out is that the regimes in the track that you can't cover, for example, with your wind tunnel, but you can cover them with some of your computational fluid dynamics simulators. So the question about <clears throat> what you need to do when with each simulator. So in this case, now we've got the real world, which is the track. We've got the sort of big simulator, which is the um, wind tunnel and a smaller simulator, which is some computational fluid dynamics. How do you decide which of these things you're going to do? Um, so the decision we had with Carl Henrik um, on Friday was a decision about where to take the next point from. But you can imagine extending that. If you're emulating everything, it's not just where to take the next point from in terms of input, like an input in this case would be the configuration of your car. Um, it's where to take the next point from in terms of, do I do a wind tunnel test? Do I run a computational fluid dynamics? Do I need to run a test at the track? 
like in practice on Friday. And the aim is that your emulator, your statistical emulator, can sort of adjudicate between which of these things should be happening. Because effectively, these three things aren't happening. And the reason you can do that is you use the same form of sequential decision making that Carl Henrik was sort of talking about on Friday. But instead of just doing it for trying to find the optima, it's like you can ask yourself questions like, what do I need to do next? Should I go to the wind tunnel? Should I run a high fidelity simulation, which is computation expensive? Or can I get away with a low fidelity simulation? Or do I actually need to wait until I'm at the track next? Now, it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about Formula One or whether you're talking about um, uh, the Amazon supply chain. The, the decisions are the same because each of these things have cost. If you want to do an experiment on the Amazon supply chain, you can do those experiments, but it costs money to um, decide to make changes to your business logic in the physical world. If you can do that same experiment in simulation, then you might prefer to do it in simulation. Okay. An additional point on that is there is no such thing. So I definitely don't like the idea that there's one emulator to rule them all. Um, there's a problem with this setup, right? In that we've already talked in, in the lecture on simulation about how the, um, <coughs> the different simulators um, are much more accurate or much, much greater capabilities, one should say, of including your physical understanding of the world within the simulator. So, you know, anything you can compute, you can put in a simulator or you can even build your wind tunnel or whatever else you want to do. In the emulator, we're constrained pretty much to these the models where we can do um, some form of maybe approximate, as Carl Henrik spoke about in the inference lecture, or in the Gaussian process case, a lot of the inference we do is exact. And here I mean inference in the original sense, not the new magical sense that the neural network people talk about. I mean statistical inference. Um, there's sort of now weirdly two ways in which we mean inference in machine learning. But I'm talking about statistical inference uh, in terms of the probabilistic inference running Bayes rule. Um, there is a limited set of models over which we can do these things. So how the hell does this make any sense that the emulator can, which is a weaker mechanistic model than the simulators, can adjudicate between them? Well, that can work because of something that was coming up again last week, that, that you should only, when you build your emulator, you're abstracting away many, many parts of the real world systems that you might not care about, right? So, so there's the emulator is contextual. The emulator is the tool of the scientist. It's not a sort of fully automated thing where you can just deploy these things without any interaction from the scientist saying, the thing I really care about is say the drag coefficient or the slow speed corners, or you know, my scientific expertise tells me the thing I have to worry about is this. And then the, you design and build your emulators to focus on that. So the hope is, or the idea is that you're using the emulator as a tool to adjudicate between these different complex physical models, but you must bring in your physical understanding as well. So what's very clear here is that you need a really nice interaction between whoever's building and designing the machine learning, the emulators, the statistics, and the domain experts. And that's something that's quite difficult for us to simulate in an academic environment. And there I mean simulate as in create for you. But um, I think as, you, as you're at the master's level and the PhD level, some of you are auditing the course from different PhDs and you'll actually be domain experts who are working on these simulations. And uh, the hope is we'll bring the machine learners and the domain experts a bit closer together. Okay, so um, what you've got in your worksheet today is um, uh, some examples of things you can do um, in a Gaussian process framework uh, that um, was written initially uh, by the group in, Pi in uh, Sheffield. Um, and it was designed with all of these sort of challenges in mind. So yes, you could write Gaussian process from scratch. You can uh, you know, do your own linear algebra and that's a great exercise. You should definitely try that and do that. But if you're trying to think at this level of the person that's designing and building emulators, what you really want is a tool set that is um, a flexible tool set for capturing your understanding of what's going on in um, the uh, 
Gaussian, uh, sorry, in the physical system within your Gaussian process so that you can deploy that model um, without worrying about the internals. And GPI is a framework we built um, with that in mind. So there's, there are other now, at the time there were no sort of Python Gaussian process frameworks. Now there's people have built other ones like um, there's one called GP Flow and there's one called GPI Torch. Uh, I think for the purposes of what we're doing, GPI is still the strongest. It's missing, it's missing some, when we were building it some seven years ago, automatic differentiation really wasn't a thing. So it doesn't do automatic differentiation and it would be great if we fix that. Um, GP Flow and uh, GPI Torch both do automatic differentiation. They're, they're using sort of PyTorch and TensorFlow as their compute engines for that. But where GPI excels is because we were thinking about, in some sense, our customer, our customer being the domain expert. Um, I think it's much uh, more feature rich in terms of the sort of things you can do with covariance functions in it. And I don't think those other frameworks have sort of caught up with it in that regard. It would be nice. The idea when we built this was there would be one framework everyone would use and then everyone decided that was a great idea and they should also build the one framework everyone would use. Um, so I don't think there's still one good one ideal Gaussian process framework, but um, uh, The nice thing about the other toolkit we'll use for emulation is it it's ambivalent. It can use any framework you choose. Um, you just have to wrap it. So um, this is a set of BSD licensed uh, software base. Um, we very specific about going for BSD license. If you're not familiar with um, software licenses, BSD or MIT licenses allow people to just use your software for commercial applications without coming back to you and paying you anything. Uh, the reason for doing that is because we're trying to have impact in terms of getting these techniques used. It's not about trying to make money out of this stuff. It's trying to just get people to use these very powerful techniques, which they should be using more often. Okay, so um, the lab sheet uh, this week is just gonna take you through a sort of short uh, GPI tutorial, um, which, uh, well, as well as the notes about the things I've said so far to just get those in your head, um, which is just to sort of teach you uh, a few things about how, um, uh, Gaussian processes are implemented in GPI. So I think we've seen already the covariance function of the Gaussian process. And um, the idea in GPI is these are sort of pre-implemented for you. So what I try and do when I'm doing these Jupyter notebooks is uh, write the maths close to the implementation. But of course here the implementation, the maths is, is totally hidden. Um, so uh, in this case here, what we're showing is um, the RBF covariance function. And then alongside the RBF covariance function, um, we're showing uh, the code that implements this in GPI. So uh, what you need to create a covariance is you need to understand its input dimension because it needs to set up a number of parameters and sometimes the parameters can vary with input dimension. So that's what the first uh, entry is doing. Uh, I often use alpha to represent um, the variance of the covariance function. So if we look at the alpha in here, um, but in GPI, we talk about that as the variance of the kernel. Why do we talk about that as the variance of the kernel? Well, because e to the minus, let's say if you've got two data points, x1 and an x, or x and x prime, and there's zero distance between them, bear in mind that this is measuring the square distance, this whole function is e to the minus zero. So this function is zero. So like if I want to measure the covariance of a point with itself, um, it's e to the minus zero, which is one. So therefore it's alpha. So in other words, the variation of any point with itself is alpha. That's giving us the effectively the overall variance of um, the function. So that's why we've used variance there because it's the sort of variance of the signal part of the function. And that's the terminology used in uh, GPI to refer to that parameter. And then the setting the length scale, which here is L. Now in GPI by default, every dimension has its own length scale. So you scale each dimension separately. Um, you can't sort of see um, that in, the code that's written here, but you'll that will become apparent uh, when you go through the notebook. Do feel free, by the way, let me just try switching that. Let's see how quickly I can do that. Uh, that work? You can see the notebook here, right? 
So that's what I was just talking about. Um, this is in Colab. You'll have seen this before in Colab. This is just getting the software to install, so pip install. Um, and we're kind of at this point now. So um, in the slides. So this is the code that's uh, implementing the covariance function. And then it's just displaying that there. OK. So you can see here's some plots that, that you'll also do in the notebook where you're looking at uh, the form of that covariance function for different, um, uh, different input functions, um, different length scales, I should say, for the exponential quadratic. So you'll get a chance to sort of play with that. Um, what GPI does for you is it gives you a range of covariance functions that are already pre-implemented for you. And what GPI will also do for you is allow you to implement your own covariance functions. That's why I can't see people entering because it's coming up on your screen. So this is um, the uh, uh, read the docs and it's explaining how you can implement different covariance functions, the different parts you need to implement. Now, because we don't have automatic differentiation, because you don't have automatic differentiation in GPI, you actually have to implement, in order to do the parameter optimization, the gradients themselves. So you end up implementing all these different components, the covariance of the kernel with itself, the diagonal of the covariance, um, but you also have to do um, these gradient terms, which if we, if we had automatic differentiation, it would do for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we did it in GPI, the old fashioned way of actually having to compute the derivative yourself. Um, let's get rid of that for you. Um, oh, what have I done now? Sorry, let me just stop sharing for a moment because I've somehow messed up my, I've lost. My slides. Okay. All right. So about that. Um, and but those are all sort of in the lab sheet for you to play with. The links are there. Um, you can start getting a sense of what you're doing. Um, but importantly, many of the common covariance functions you might want to use are already defined for you. So the Matern family is, is an important family of covariance functions. Brownian motion. Remember, we got started on this whole thing by talking about Einstein and Brownian motion. That's defined as a covariance function. There's, very cool things you can do with Gaussian processes like periodic covariance functions, and you can include linear terms. And very importantly, you can add terms together. So um, what this is showing you here is the sort of simple, we just uh, allow you to, if you've defined two covariance functions in GPI. You're not sharing your screen. Oh, crumbs, yeah. Thank you. It's always like, how long should we let Neil look like an idiot for? It's always a question. Isn't Five it? seconds. So yeah, here's the combined covariance functions um, uh, that you can now see. Um, so in the code, in this case, look, you can see we've just overloaded the add operator in Python. I mean, that's that's about as far as we go in terms of uh, probabilistic programming is the ability to add these things together quickly. Because of course, that turns out to be a very important operation because it's saying that what I think is that there's two underlying processes here one of which is, a, is coming from the RBF or exponentiated quadratic, as I would call it, and the other of which is coming from a turn. And the, uh, what I'm seeing is the result of those two processes being added together. Um, that, can, that type of construction is extremely useful. Um, the other thing that's easy to do is um, multiplication. So same thing here, but here we're multiplying them. That has a slightly different interpretation that I won't go into now, but there's some um, Oh, I've used the wrong one, sorry. 
uh, here's the multiplication. So it, that's got a slightly different interpretation uh, when you multiply two covariances together. So if you look at the previous one, um, we were adding two covariances together um, and coming up with a new covariance. And here we're multiplying them together. But GPI makes it very easy for you to play with all of that. I mean, and you'll do a sort of little example in GPI of, of doing a model fit. So um, uh, it's just a noisy sign example. Uh, so there's some data here. And once you've got your kernel, and here in this case, we're just using a um, standard RBF covariance function. And here, notice the variance is set to one and the length scale is set to one. Okay, but, but look at this axis. So this is the sort of thing, you know, the notion that uh, machine learning models are just point and click, I, I feel is kind of wrong. You have to think about what you're doing in your parameter initialization. So if we look at the, the actual scale on this input here, the length scale is a very nice interpretable parameter, right? So when we look at this um, scale here, we see that this is unit scale across here. And the length scale of this thing is one itself. So when we see the fit, also um, in the next slide, also we're using quite a large variance for this fit. We see the fit is kind of very poor because we haven't optimized those parameters. Those are the, just the parameters at initialization. But GPI makes it easy for you to do the optimization. So um, you can see here, that's just saying message is equals true. I appreciate that blue is hard to read. Um, this is the command once you've set up the model to fit it, and then this is the plot you get afterwards where the models um, reduced the uh, noise variance, it's reduced the length scale, and it's fitting um, somewhat better this, um, this data. Um, so that's just the setup there. So it's three lines basically to do the fit. That's one of the things I often say about machine learning. I mean, once you've got the right model fit, the amount of code you have, ignoring all the data pre-processing code, which is where most of the work is, is often gonna be just like sort of three lines as it is in this case. Um, now, the other example you've got in the uh, slides is, the, um, is an emulation example. So um, this function here is known as the Branin function. You don't have to care too much about this. It's just used as a, an exemplar function for um, very often for Bayesian optimization, but actually we're gonna use it um, for a simple emulation example. So another exercise you're going to do in the worksheet is the computation of the expectation of this function. So this function f of x, which has this form, um, where uh, the expectation is over a uniform distribution on the inputs. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna do that in a couple of different ways. You, you're gonna, you can, first of all, um, what the assumption is, is you've got 25 points on a grid where this function is evaluated. Why don't I just pull that up so that we can see what we're talking about here. Um, here we go. So, that's the bit down here. And this is the actual fit that I obtained with the Browning function. So you should be looking for something like that. Um, so what you're gonna do here is a few different things. So oh, those cells are hidden. Here's the computation, here's the Browning function being defined in code. Here's the computation of um, uh, the value of that function at 25 different points, those points are laid out on a grid. That's what this little bit of code does here at the top, creates that grid. Um, now, of course, this is a very cheap to evaluate function, right? But the idea is whenever you're doing this, you're supposed to imagine that each of these function evaluations, and there's 25 all going on here simultaneously, pretend that that's, being, um, that's emerging from say a climate simulation with a particular set of values. So instead of the Branin simulation with two inputs, it's some climate simulation you're interested in. So each of these 25 data points might be taking like, you know, 100 hours to acquire or $500,000 of compute to acquire. So the idea is that you've got this very limited representation. And then what you'll go on to, and this is an attempt to estimate um, this expectation using that limited uh, representation, and it's a very poor attempt, 
And then what you'll see is you can instead do that by you can build a little Gaussian process emulator. And so this is what you're doing here is building a Gaussian process emulator um, and fitting the Gaussian process. You're, sense, you're doing some sensible initialization of the length scale, fitting that Gaussian process emulator to the Branin function. So these are the evaluation points that you've got on the grid. And then this is the Gaussian process fit. And then instead of doing the expectation directly on these evaluation points, you do the expectation on that fit instead. And indeed, you'll see we, we wouldn't have suggested it otherwise um, that you get a much more accurate answer. Oh, look at that, a little error. That should say model. Um, so that really improves the, uh, the uh, quality. OK. Right. Um, so tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit more about experimental design and how you do that sort of thing. But um, you know, the rest of today's sheet is really sort of um, just covering a little bit of the history of this. So the domain that we blundered into is known as, in some fields, as uncertainty qualification, uh, quantification. So that should say they review, not the review. Um, and I've listed a paper here that you can find online, which is back in uh, 1979 of people doing this in practice. It has this wonderful um, quaint way of referring to uh, simulations as um, computer code. Um, and that's because, of course, in 79, you know, I mean, you, this would be Fortran code, presumably. It would be a lot of work to write and maintain. Um, and the simulation itself is of little interest that they talk about in this paper. But the, the main ways that they review how you go about these things are kind of interesting. Random sampling, stratified sampling, Latin hypercube sampling. Now, the thing that you're doing in the, um, in the lab, uh, sorry, in the worksheet is effectively random sampling in order to estimate this expectation of this function. Um, there are these other approaches um, which are uh, certainly uh, can be better uh, as other ways of formulating Monte Carlo estimates. But really the point in showing you this paper is that the, the work goes all the way back to the sort of uh, 1970s and before. So this is the random sampling. This is what you actually do in the lab class. Um, this is a quote directly from that paper. Um, other forms of sampling like stratified sampling can be more efficient. And then Latin hypercube sampling is a very common form. Now, what we're going to see uh, next time is um, approaches to doing this form of what one would call experimental design. So the problem that we've sort of blundered into is known as experimental design. Where do I choose to run my simulator to get the answer I need, which in this case, so we've ask for the expected output of the Branin function, but the answer you might need in a climate example could, for example, be what's the expected increase in temperature across the globe across the next uh, 100 years. In Formula One, um, when you're doing race strategy simulation, the answer that they're looking for is typically what is the expected number of championship points that I will get from this strategy? You, of course, might be interested in other things like what's the variation? You might want a strategy that is guaranteeing you a certain number of points rather than a strategy that is higher expected number of points, but a uh, higher variance. Um, so the last thing that the, is in there um, in the lab sheet is, is this thing called the MUKIT playground. So um, just as a sort of example, one of the things we found in um, in Amazon is we sort of lived or died by the extent to which vice presidents thought what we were saying was a good or bad idea. Uh, so this is a nice little thing put together by, um, uh, he was a software engineering intern from, I think it was Dundee University in his final year, Adam Hurst, who came to work with the team at Amazon. And he worked with uh, my software development manager, Cliff McCullum. Uh, Cliff was a sort of software guy and was so very keen on the idea of is there a way of building um, a, uh, a sort of demo of what emulation and MUKIT is doing, but the sort of demo, demo that we can share with vice presidents. Not that vice presidents aren't technically brilliant and amazing clever people, they are, 
but they don't necessarily have the time to do a sort of 10 lecture course um, on emulation. So this is what we created for them, which was a sort of set of introductions to simulation. So you'll find this online. There's a, it should be a link to it from the notes. It's called the Emukit Playground. Um, it's a taxi simulation. So it's really an Uber example rather than an Amazon example. Um, and it just goes through uh, the sort of what I've just been saying, but in very simple terms. So do feel free to have a play with that. Um, you can build emulators and uh, do them alongside taxi simulations. Uh, if particularly if you're a vice president type rather than a scientist uh, technical type. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say today. Tomorrow, what I'm gonna start introducing to you is, so I've introduced an approach for building these models. Um, and tomorrow, what I want to introduce to you is the approach for um, uh, doing the emulation that we also built out of Amazon. So we ended up building a software stack uh, for doing emulation in practice. And I think this is something that you might find useful in your projects because it's a very um, flexible stack that allows you to sort of use existing emulation techniques, but also modify them and sort of uh, change acquisition functions and all this sort of thing within the same piece of software. Um, that's called EmuKit. Um, it was uh, the sort of scientific lead on that was a guy called Javier Gonzalez. He will be a guest lecturer in week eight, I think. Is that right, Carl Henrik? Javier is week eight. And um, the lead software engineer on that is a guy called Andrei Palais, who is a PhD student in the department now and will be guest lecturer in week six. So it's something that um, we've got a lot of familiarity with, but I think it. I mean, I know it's already widely used. It's certainly used um, within Amazon uh, on multiple places as a framework for doing this type of experimental design in practice. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>